Hello, I'm Mark Payne. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the West Virginia Humanities Council that brings historical figures to life through portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. These presentations are both entertaining and educational. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to nonprofit organizations across West Virginia, such as schools, libraries, historical societies, and a wide range of civic groups. The presentation fee is paid by the council, and we ask only that their travel costs be covered by the host group. History Live is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. We encourage your organization or school to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Booker T. Washington, Mad Ann Bailey, or Babe Ruth come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures and make them more real. Nothing compares to the live, in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts, a monologue, a question-answer session with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. The presenters on our History Alive roster have researched a variety of sources such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History Live presentation is not a play, it's an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Alive presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we will change the format a bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give you a sample of how a History Alive presentation can add to the offerings at your school or organization. There will be information on the screen at the end of this program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Alive character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guest from history. We're pleased to have with us in the studio, Chief of the Shawnees, the Cornstalk. I am Clan of the Water Panther, Chief Counselor of the Shawano. Fathers, <laughs> although I know not why I should call you fathers, you, the disobedient children of the king, I know my father and his before him, they are not among you. However, the elders have advised I respect you, and I am the obedient son. I will address you so, brothers, I bring this gift of wampum so that you will know my words are true. And to cleanse your ears of the songs of bad birds so you may better hear that truth. These strands to wipe the tears from your eyes so you may see your true friends. Brothers, when I was a young man, I went to war many times. Each time I thought that it would be my last and that I would return no more. Now, I am here at Fort Randolph and among you, my old enemies in peace. And you may kill me if you wish. It is all the same to me for one time as good as another. None are so glorious, brothers, as a warrior returned from battle. And yet there are none so alone. Ah, the young men gather for the stories. Elders, proudly bearing their marks of battle, stand by you and keep your cup full, but they speak not. All warriors have a constant companion in battle. Ah, friends and enemies come and go quickly, but there is one who was always by your side, this, this is the spirit of death. Like a jealous wife, she uh, pursues and challenges, and like a jealous wife is at times your enemy, and at times your friend, but always near you. And then when the battle is done, the guns are silent, she quickly retires to a dark corner there to patiently, quietly await him. 
Brothers, in my youth, I lived near the great council town, Shamokin, at the forks of the Susquehanna. There met the great chiefs of many nations. When I had ten winters, my family, the Chalagata, offended the Seneca. And we were asked to, though we remained the little brothers of the six nations, remove to the south, to the land we called Spelewitipi, the Big Turkey River. Six nations called it Ohio country. There we settled a town on the mouth of the Seoto. We grew corn, beans, and squash in the fertile bottoms in the summer and in the winter removed to the winter hunting grounds in the mountainous land to the south in the land that we called Kentucky. We saw the Francais always. They were always among us, black robes, the godmen of the Francais uh, and the traders of the Francais for more than a man's lifetime. We thought little when the soldiers of Celeron de Bainville came down the river. They told us that they should be allowed to plant great leaden seeds at the mouths of the rivers. This would help to keep the great hairy beast called the English away. We had heard of the English. Hairy beast that ate the land like a hungry bear in the spring. I grew curious of these English and went to where I knew of some traders of the English resided. I watched as one worked about his cabin as I hid in the brush. In the eaves of the cabin there lived a tiny stinging insect called the wasp. She helped him in her small way by filling the cracks with mud, but she protected her home, and he was stung. I saw then a curious thing. The Englishman called out a great oath, damning the wasp and all her kin, even calling down the wrath of the great spirit on this tiny insect. And then he took fire and burnt the villages of all of the wasps, very nearly setting fire to his cabin to assure himself that the wasp and all her children were dead. I knew then why the English were so feared and how I would make war on them. Within a few years, our fathers the Francais began to call for warriors to come to the forks of the Ohios. There they had built a great stone house called Fort Duquesne. They said the English had sent far across the water for a great war captain named Edward Braddock, who would come with the greatest army in the world and sweep them from the forks. Many soldiers attended these war. I was among them. We went to meet the English army on the Allegheny. The night before, we prayed and painted, for we knew many of us would cross over. But when this great war captain came into the field, he caused his men to stand in tight groups in the open. They wore bright coats, and he would not let them tree. They tied long knives on the ends of their guns and stood in tight groups as though they expected us to leap from the brush and impale ourselves on their knives. <laughs> we laughed at their foolishness and shot them down like pigeons. But there was one, a young war captain who could not be killed. Horses were shot from under him and his coat full of holes, but he would not die. We saw that he was protected by a great spirit and went to kill others. We have since come to know him as the town destroyer. Englishmen call him George Washington. He covered the retreat of the army across the mountains, leaving dead all along the trail. 
Now, the six nations of the north, our old brothers, fought openly beside the British soldiers against us. The Virginias, the disobedient children of the king, fought us from the east. And the Tsalagis, our old enemy from the south, pushed us hard from that quarter. And when things looked as though it could get no worse, one day, the Francais were gone. And then a confederation of Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Ojibwe, and Odawa came from the west. They were led for by a great war captain named Pontiac. Pontiac had with him a prophet of the Delaware named Nailin. Nailin spoke, and it was as a breath of spring. He said we had angered the great spirit by becoming too dependent on the traders. We'd left animals half eaten in the woods. This angered the great spirit and we were dependent on the traders to feed our families. If we were to go back to the ways of the grandfathers, arrows tipped with stone, clubs of the sugar tree and knives of the flint, it would give us the spiritual strength to move the whites back across the mountains. On our side of the mountains, along the Greenbrier, were two villages of the English. One on the big levels, the Clendenin settlement. The other on the Middy Creek, only a league apart. A, a shot heard in one would alert the other. The Muddy Creek settlement was taken quickly and silently. We found that arrows tipped with stone flew more rapidly and more silently than the clumsy muskets of the English. Clubs of the sugar tree and knives of the flintstone killed as readily. The village was taken quickly and we moved onto the village on the big levels. On the way there we ran into Captain Clendenin himself. He had heard not of the war. He had taken three elk and invited us to come to a great feast. We were hungry and went to this meal. The whiskey was brought out. An old man uh, came to the table and asked me if I had some magical Indian cure for his wife. She had a sore on her leg which would not heal and brought her to the table. The leg was black and smelled of death. I knew of only one cure and I knocked her on the head. This was the signal for the general battle and Fifty scalps and captives were taken to the towns. Mrs. Clendenin, a woman whose tongue was so sharp, uh, she made me believe I had done her husband a great service in killing him. When she slipped from the trail, one of the warriors advised that he would bring the cow to the calf and caused her infant to cry, but she came not. We did not look for her long. Over the next few years, we took nine of the 12 British forts, and then a treaty at Fort Stanwix, made the peace and established the River Ohio as the border between the rapidly growing colony of Virginia and our nation, the river gave over our hunting grounds to the south, to Virginia, the land that we called Kentucky. Ah, Colonel Bullet came to us. He said that his Kentucky men would not shoot the game, but would only till the soil, that it was the game that we needed for our sustenance, and we were welcome to hunt among them. But I, myself, saw the buffalo laying dead in the field, only a tongue or some choice piece of meat cut from them, the rest left for the wolves. There would be trouble. Late in the summer, the governor himself, 
John Murray, an Earl of Dunmore, came to the village. He said that there must be a great peace to last for all time. That if we were to give him great numbers of acres of land, he would make this peace. I said, why should we give you anything? He told me that as he spoke, a great army of Virginians gathered at the mouth of Kanawha Sipi. There, under Andrew Lewis, they uh, would threaten the towns. There will be a great peace. And to attend this peace, we will have a feast. I took the hunters. Near a thousand warriors gathered at the mouth of Campaign Creek. There we made rafts and crossed the river in the night. We cut the army off of Lewis in the morning, made a line from the Ohio to the Kanawha, and attacked him. He had been so foolish as to place no guards. A great battle began, which lasted all the day. And near the end of the day, we received word that another army of Virginias came down the river, a fresh army with fresh supplies. I intended to serve the governor, Andrew Lewis, for breakfast, but it was not to be. I went back to the village and told the people, now what shall we do? We have fought our hardest, and still they come like the leaves on the trees. Shall we now try to make peace? Or shall we kill our women and children and fight until we should die? The old men looked at the ground and answered not. I will go and make peace and struck the ground with my hatchet. The Treaty of Camp Charlotte. said that all of the chief men should turn themselves in as hostage to the peace. My sister volunteered to be the first. My son then took her place. Now it is me. I will turn myself in at Camp Randolph. There, replace my son. Perhaps he will be released from Pittsburgh soon. Now the cornstalk has spoke at great length. I am now here at Fort Randolph, bringing the wampum to make the peace. Perhaps some of you would like questions of the cornstalk. Hey. I'm here with the chief of the Shawnees, the cornstalk. Chief Cornstalk, I'd like to welcome you for being here today and thank you for for joining us and, and sharing your time with us today. Bonishi. I have just a, a, a couple of questions here for you, if, if I may. Uh, first of which is, you were uh, at the Battle of the Point, uh, what yeah. many of us call the Battle of Point Pleasant. Uh, what's your recollection of the battle? The governor had come and asked to be uh, uh, given m m much land that the army of Lewis would be set against the towns if we would not. I took the warriors and we gathered at the mouth of Campaign Creek, uh, made rafts and crossed the river, cutting the army of Lewis off. Lewis had been so foolish as to put out no guards nor scouts. We camped there and rested. Uh, many of the young men are uh, hard to control. They called to the soldiers in the camp, blow your whistle now, come Yankees, come and fight. But they would not, uh, their leader would not uh, let them go and fight until the, the, the sun had come up. And by then, they slept. Um, we cut them off and the battle began. By noon, all had run out of ammunition even the Virginias. Uh, we fought with knives and clubs, trying to outflank one another. My sister, Nun Halima, had organized the women and the boys to line the riverbanks on, on either side to, uh, cap uh, to club the Virginias should they escape by swimming the river. But it was not to be. 
with the army of Captain Christian came from the north. They would be there by midnight. I saw that. The scouts told me of this. My war captain, Poksinwa, who was killed at the battle, turned the battle over to me and his death. And I called the men from the field. And we returned across the Ohio. Though we killed many more of the Virginians as they killed of us, they claimed the victory. Well, it's, it's known that you've always been a warrior. And uh, so, so how is it that you decided to, to make peace when you went back, as you said earlier, and, and, and discussed it with your people? I had grown too old to run with the hunters. <laughs> the, the women asked me, out of respect, to become chief counselor. Uh, I wished to lead the people in peace as I had led them in war. At the front, unlike the captains of the Yangese who stand on the hill safely and wave their sword, I wished to be in the front and among the first in the field. I wished to lead them in peace. Well, as, as a chief, why don't you just command your people to keep the peace? <laughs> it is not so. The English king lives far across the sea. He sees not the mischief of his children, the Virginias. Uh, the spirit of the Englishman lived there with him. Uh, should the king die, the spirit would die with him, for his is the thought. The Englishmen are but his arm and his hand. Among the Shawano, the people of the Shawano are the thought. The cornstalk is but their arm. I do the bidding of the people. Some day the cornstalk will fall and turn to dust, but the spirit will live on in the children. You're, you have a sister who uh, I think the English know as, uh, as Katie, but yeah. uh, is uh, non Halema, and she's called the Grenadier Squaw. Is she a warrior? I feel she is called the Grenadier Squaw, for she is uh, in excess of um, a fathom tall. Uh, what you call six feet. Uh, the grenadiers are in excess of six feet, and I feel she has called that. She has been chief of her own village and is now. Uh, she helps in the peace movement and uh, keeping the peace. Uh, when at the Battle of the Point, my sister helped to organize the women, but they took no scalps nor captives. Uh, you have a, uh, I must compliment you, you have a handsome wardrobe uh, today. I, I want to ask you why your ears, your earlobes uh, look uh, like they've been stretched out. Does that have any particular uh, meaning? Why do they look like that? Uh, the macaroni of the time. The young men, uh, when they come of age, are taken to the woods by the elders. The, their youth is uh, scrubbed from them. They are, uh, their noses and ears are bored and some of the in ears are uh, stretched with uh, lead weights, the cut and stretched. Uh, then uh, to, to be proud of their ears, they are bound with uh, brass wire to make them stand out. As you might imagine, this is difficult to walk through the brush with your ears uh, on display, so uh, this is done so that the spirits may be more easily heard. But in the brush, one must tie their ears behind their head to uh, keep them from catching in the brush. Uh, in the wintertime, they are likely to get frostbitten and fall off, and they must be packed with down. Ah. Well, at this time, I would like to welcome the presenter of uh, Cornstalk, who is actually Dan Cutler. Dan Cutler of Milton, West Virginia, and has been a long time uh, roster member on our History Live roster. Dan, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Mark. You're one of the, one of the old guard on our History Live group <laughs> does a great job and very experienced. So I'm going to ask you what I always ask everyone, which is uh, you were interested to do uh, uh, the Cornstalk. You've done Chief Logan for us for many years as well, and, and, I, and I, th I know you do other characters also, but how did you go about your research for uh, the character of Cornstalk? I I, I need to take this opportunity to thank my friends. I'm, I'm a, a, a reenactor and have been a reenactor for a number of years. 
uh, I have a lot of friends who are reenactors, and reenactors are interested in doing research all the time. And I'm very lucky that uh, any of the any of the things, most of the things that I've run into has been a result of uh, some of my friends turning me on to uh, journal entries, or uh, a, a lot of the internet is uh, gives you access to journal old journal entries. Of course, it has to be corroborated. But uh, journal entries of uh, 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 a gentleman named Fleming, who wrote a great deal about uh, the early days in '73 and '74, uh, the uh, military records and the records of uh, of the Moravian missionaries uh, mm -hmm. give us a lot of uh, a lot of information. Uh, as you know, that the uh, Cornstock and none of the Shawnee, or very few of the Shawnee, could read and write and kept no records. Uh, but the people who were involved in the wars, in the Dunmore's War and the French War, uh, and uh, uh, even the uh, the Revolutionary War, uh, kept good records to be able to get their pensions from the government mm -hmm. for 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 all purposes. Well, that, that remind, you know, some some folks maintain that the Battle of Point Pleasant uh, was the first battle of the American Revolution. Do you know what logic? Uh, is used, or how how they how some folks come to that conclusion? It's it's actually the first documented case of the uh, British Army uh, acting at odds with the American Army, with the American Army, which were they were British Army until that battle, and and that separated both armies. There was no love lost between the governor and Andrew Lewis, and at at some point during that battle, or right after that battle. Uh, the governor had to actually pull his sword and threaten Lewis to uh, get him to do his bidding. Uh, in later years, after the revolution, the pension uh, pensions were applied for, and they had to draw a line of what was actually the revolution and what was Dunmore's War before that, and the French War before that, and Pontiac's War, you know, in, in the interim, and. Uh, and the people from the revolution got um, uh, pensions. The government was real uh, was easily convinced that that was just part of the Indian Wars and not because it was going to save them a lot of money. No. You know, and uh, and so so the the first battle, according to records, happened in Lexington a few months just a few months later. Mm -hmm. But uh, but this was seen as part of the old Indian War. Okay. Well, here, in the last 45 seconds here, uh, what, where, where did uh, the Cornstalk come to his uh, end, and, mm. and what was the circumstance there? Uh, the stipulations of the Treaty of Camp Charlotte were that headmen be sent to each nation. His sister uh, volunteered to be at first, and she, she had her own agenda, and she helped spy on the, for that year, a year's time is what it was. His son took her, his, her place, uh, at Ellen Ipsico. And on his way back from Pittsburgh, uh, he stopped at Fort Randolph and they caught him there and killed them both. They mm -hmm. killed all four of the. Uh, and that was uh, 7, 17, 1777? November the 10th, 1777. Okay. Dan Cutler, thanks for being with us on History Live. Thank you. Mm -hmm.